I would like to welcome everybody to the 5,573rd meeting of the Rotary Club of Chicago. Rotary One is now in session in person. <laughs> welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. And I'm uh, honored today to be able to start our program with the thought of the day uh, with our very own Bob Westrup. Bob, please come up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, how many of you are bikers? Go out and enjoy the bike. Wow, it's a big group. And I bet you out there on Zoom, there's a big group there. I usually don't wear a prop like this if you can see me, but I have a sling on. So six weeks ago, exactly, I was going out for my morning bike ride. It was a cold morning. It was May 11th. I put on an extra layer of clothes, including a little ski hat, and started out down the road towards the forest preserve, and then thought to myself, you don't have your helmet on. So I went back and I put my helmet on. I uh, then rode about a mile and a half to the forest preserve into a place that I consider a really safe place. About a mile later, as I was speeding up, I went airborne, landed on my back in pain, trying to figure out and assess what just happened to me, okay? There was nobody around, it was cold. I found my cell phone across the path. I tried to call my wife, she's not up that early. I called 911, I thought I didn't have any other choice and I didn't know how bad I was. So I called 911 and in talking to the woman, I had to figure out how to guide her to me. I wasn't on a road, there wasn't a mile marker, there wasn't a street sign or a cross sign. Fortunately, she got the park ranger to come to find me, get me to the EMS where they took off most of my clothes and cut off a number of them. I could tell by the look on the EMS guy, I was in trouble. Uh, and I found out later when I got to the hospital, uh, Lake Forest Northwestern that I'd broken two ribs, punctured a lung, and broke my clavicle. So this was major league. Um, I left the hospital four days later, but before I did it, one of the doctors came by and he said, you know, we've done a bunch of CAT scans on you, but we haven't done one of your head. Did you hit your head? I said, well, my knees all got a big gash in it. I broke the ribs, I broke my shoulder bone, but no, I don't remember ever hitting my head. He said, well, let's do a CAT scan. So they did the scan, they found out there was nothing wrong or anything up there. <laughs> um, so after I got out of the hospital, I was walking into the house from the garage and I saw the pile of clothes that the ranger had brought to my wife along with the bike. And I looked at the helmet. And there I noticed there was a big dent in the front of the helmet, okay? So my thought for the day is when you're out there having fun on your bike during the summer, please um, take responsibility for a little bit of risk management, wear your helmet so you can live like I did to tell this story. Well, we're very happy to, to hear that you're, you're safe and sound, relatively speaking, and uh, here with us today, Bob, and, and that is something good to, to keep in mind. I am a bicyclist as, as well, and uh, uh, I thought I heard once a statistic that uh, you know, the largest number of ac bike accidents actually happen like on the, on the lakefront bike trail, for, for example. You generally think that it's on the roads, but there's just such a huge volume of, of traffic on some of those trails that, that sometimes you think you're safe, but yeah, you have to be wearing your helmet. Uh, no matter where you're going. I certainly agree with that. Um, so a couple of announcements uh, for us here before we get started with our program. Uh, first of all, you may notice QR codes on some of your tables. Uh, the QR code is just a means of accessing the gyrator. So uh, instead of lots and lots of copies of the gyrator, which is online. Uh, you're welcome to access it uh, via your phone. Um, if you do need a hard copy, uh, just let us know and, and we can arrange that for you. Uh, also, uh, under this sort of uh, new structure here, as we're all kind of getting our, our sea legs together on how these hybrid meetings will work, uh, I do ask 
to please, if you can, try to register in advance uh, for the in-person meetings. It's not an issue for the Zoom meetings, of, of course, uh, but for the in-person meetings in order to let the Union League Club know how many meals that we need. Uh, I'm always happy to give up my meal uh, if I need to, uh, but it means you're you're going to be taking a meal away from the president, so you don't want to do that. Uh, but uh, the Union League Club, you know, has been obviously struggling through this uh, whole time as well, and they're down on staff, so it, it's a little bit harder to be nimble. Uh, so if you can please register at least by Monday at noon, if possible, if you know that you're coming, uh, that will make it a lot easier for, for everybody. It'll make sure that we have a meal for you. Um, you're still welcome to come. You just might not, there might not be a meal there for you. Um, and then the other announcement I have is just about our end of the year survey. So we're about a year into our strategic plan. And one of the things that we said we would do with our strategic plan is just to kind of reassess once a year where we're at. And it is now time for that reassessment. So we want to hear from you what you think we did that was good, what was not so good, where we can improve. Uh, we'd love, love to hear that and keep that strategic plan alive and moving forward. Uh, and then one more announcement we have before we get into the program is actually not for me, but it is for Marga. Uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about the annual campaign and give us an update or or, or, or would you rather do that later, Marga? Are you ready for that? Sorry, I saw you just put a big bite of food into your mouth. <laughs> my apologies. It was on my agenda. It might not have been on yours. <laughs> All right. Our, our, yeah, why don't you come on up here? Why don't you come on up here? Because we have people on Zoom, so they should be able to see you and hear you on the mic. Hello, everybody. Um, Wow, the microphone. <laughs> so how, hello everybody on Zoom. <laughs> um, well, the good news that I have to share, which we shared last week, is that we reached the goal for what we wanted to raise for the Rotary Foundation. And we need a few more dollars to reach the goal for the Rotary One Foundation. And those of you who have contributed, I want to say thank you so much. And I'm glad that you put up with me, but I am not done. Okay. <laughs> so uh, you have time. If you're on Zoom and you're listening to me, you know what you need to do. All right. Uh, it would be such a treat to reach the goals for both foundations. And I know we can do it. All right. Uh, as I said in a previous meeting, the foundations provide us the fuel for what we want to do. And this year has been truly spectacular in the number of projects we have been involved in spite of all the limitations of the pandemic. So be a part of it from $5 to the sky is the limit. So I'm counting on you, on everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marga. And thanks for the great work you've been doing on that. Next year, you'll be uh, all be bothered by Timo for most of the year. So you'll have to adjust to that. <laughs> uh, so as we get started into our program, uh, just a reminder for folks, again, we're going to have questions now. We're going to be fielding questions from two different places. Uh, if you are on Zoom, please type your question into the chat box and I will uh, uh, read those questions aloud. And uh, if you are here in the room, uh, you'll just raise your hand and uh, we'll pass around a microphone and you can actually just state those, those questions. And so we'll probably do in-room questions first and then go to Zoom questions. Uh, and so to introduce our speaker today, I am going to pass the stage over to our program's co-chair and senior VP, with uh, UBS, Mr. David Hirsch. Uh, thank you, Eric. It feels good to be back at the Union League Club. I've been a member here for 28 years and haven't been here for a year and a half. And my wife was saying, well, why have you continued to pay those dues uh, the last year and a half? <clears throat> and I said, well, that's a good question. Uh, with the benefit insight, maybe I should have put my members but uh, it's another way to support the club um, by continuing to pay your uh, dues 
and I was pleasantly surprised that my suit still fit. So um, <laughs> it's nice to be uh, here with so many of you and uh, to see some of you uh, by Zoom. Um, <clears throat> it's my pleasure uh, to introduce um, one of our uh, speakers, uh, Mark Vargas. Uh, Mark is a trusted advisor and close confidant uh, to some of the highest profile political and business leaders in America. He is widely respected as a technology entrepreneur in healthcare, political opinion writer, and media strategist, and appears regularly on local and national media. Mark is a Chicago area native. He earned his bachelor's of arts degree from Judson University. Uh, from 2007 to 2010, Mark served as a civilian within the office of the Secretary of Defense on a special task force that specialized in rebuilding Iraq's war-torn economy by attracting foreign direct investment opportunities and helping facilitate public and private partnerships to create jobs and drive down terrorist-related activities associated with unemployment. In 2009, he was awarded the Secretary of Defense Global War on Terrorism Civilian Service Medal. His civilian service in the De Defense Department included 14 trips to Baghdad and expanded across two presidential administrations. In 2017, Mark and his business partners launched a startup in the healthcare, and later that same year, the Huff Post featured their early stage company as an early innovator in regulatory technology, also known as RegTech. The company continues to grow and Mark remains its president. Mark is a dedicated writer and contributor for the Washington Examiner and Newsmax. He's also appeared regularly on Newsmax TV, offering insights and analysis on top news stories of the day. Mark also serves on the board of the Associated Colleges of Illinois, and as chairman of the board of Judson University's World Leaders Forum, we also host a speakers program called Conversations with Mark Vargas. More recently, he has been hosting a radio program on AM560 called Mark My Words. Mark, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank, thank you for that very kind introduction. David, I should have sent you a shorter one, actually. <laughs> Sorry for making that so long. And hello to those that are watching on Zoom. Uh, and for the record, I am wearing pants. I'm not wearing shorts. I was giving a, a, a national TV interview and they needed to adjust my lighting. And so they said, Mark, real quick, can you adjust the lighting? And I was dressed in a suit, but then I was wearing swim trunks, you know? And, and so uh, I made sure that when they did the when, when they did the Zoom there, that they made sure that they didn't catch that I was wearing swim trunks because they wanted that longer, longer view. But it's an honor for me to, to be here today. And, you know, it's all about, what I love about Rotary is it's about making a difference. It doesn't matter what your politics are. doesn't matter where your zip code is. It's about making a difference. And it reminds me of our national motto, e pluribus unum which means out of many, one. And I was doing some research before today's event. I was struck by not only that this is Rotary One. I've had the privilege of speaking at Rotary Clubs in St. Charles and Geneva and Batavia and Elgin and West Dundee, but I've never been to the mothership, Rotary One. So this is very special uh, for me to be here. And as I was doing a little bit of research I was struck by, it was the Rotary Club that helped during the 1918 pandemic. And it was the Rotary Club that helped during the 2020 pandemic. And so I wanna acknowledge all of you Rotarians, not just here at Rotary One, but across the globe for all of, for the impact that you all made in terms of delivering PPE. I was just talking to Eric, you delivered over 3000 meals to first responders and to elderly residents. You donated iPads to elderly residents at nursing homes so that they could FaceTime with loved ones and family members. And this is just not a feather in your cap here at Rotary One, but across the globe. And so I wanted to thank you and salute you for all of your work during this pandemic, not just in 2020, but in 1918. So thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank David once again for his very, very kind introduction and for his invitation 
to speak here today. And, and David, you've got, you're doing God's work, tremendous work with your dad to dad podcast and about the importance of fathers in our lives. And I know we just celebrated father's day. Um, and it's, it's, uh, our moms are really important, but we can't also forget about our dads. So thank you for doing God's work on that as well. You know, September 11th, 2001 was really my lightning bolt moment. I was a student at Judson University in Elgin. I was a sophomore and my mom called my dorm room and woke me up and said, turn on the television. So I stumbled out of bed and walked into the main common area in time to see the second plane fly into the World Trade Towers. And as we were gathered about 15 guys uh, in front of the television, my initial reaction was, I'm gonna do something about this. And at that moment, my life had purpose, it had direction, and it had meaning. And I'll never forget, you know, some of you might remember, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. when you learned of his assassination. Some of you might remember when you learned of uh, President John F. Kennedy's assassination. These are moments that are seared into our memories. And all of us remember September 11th. And I'll never forget walking into the chapel and how quiet it was outside. And we'll all remember the blue skies and not a single aircraft being so close to Chicago, we always have O'Hare traffic, not a single aircraft in the sky. And I walk into the chapel, which seats over 500, and it is silent with the exception of sniffles and people crying. And it was a, um, it's a moment that I'll never forget, but that purpose is what drove me to service similar to what the purpose of the Rotary Club and why you were all here is service. And I got that opportunity several years later when I was interviewing at the Pentagon. I only had $72 in my checking account when I moved to Washington, DC. I didn't have a job. I didn't have a place to live. I had one suit uh, and it fit. I did have to get this refitted by my tailor, by the way. Uh, I've got a whole line of suits now that I have to get refitted thanks to the pandemic and the COVID-12. Um, but um, I went to the Pentagon because I was asked to, for, to go for an interview and to spend time in Iraq. And I was intimidated because there were all of these flags and all of these seals of the different branches of the military. And it's the Pentagon. It's a very intimidating place to be. And there were Marine colonels and and SESs and senior leaders in this interview. And they said, we're gonna ask you one question, one very important question. You know where you're going, which is Iraq, why? And this has been a, a question that I had been not realizing, but I had been preparing since 9-11-01 as a student at Judson in Elgin. And without hesitation, without any preparation, I said, I believe that we're waging the battle of our generation in the Middle East and particularly in Iraq. And one day I want to look back and say that I was a small link in bringing stability to a war-torn country. And I said, well, good answer. And they all get up and they left. And I asked one of the aides that escorted me into the Pentagon, because you can't walk alone in the Pentagon unless you have a security clearance. So I asked one of the aides that escorted me into the building and into the meeting, what happened? She's like, I don't know. Well, 24 hours later, I had an email from the White House personnel office uh, for me to fill out my SF-86, my security clearance form. And three weeks later, I was on my first trip into Baghdad. And I took a total of 14 trips. And I think that what we were doing in Iraq and politics aside, what our job was, was not the political side. We weren't on the military side. We were the civilian team, was a unique task force that was, our only objective was to put Iraqis back to work because Iraq, there's a direct correlation between high unemployment and violence, not just in a combat zone, but in any major city here, Chicago, Detroit, LA, Philadelphia. And Iraq's unemployment at that time was over 60%. And so you had educated men that were running around with AK-47s because the insurgents were paying cash to shoot anyone with an American flag patch on their shoulder. And so our job was critical. It was important because we believed and we knew that the faster we did our job of putting local Iraqis back to work, the faster they'd stop shooting and killing our service members. And so 
we brought in teams and we did an analysis and we identified about 60 factories throughout Iraq, Northeast, South and West. And we went about opening those factories under certain criteria. Number one, which factories could reopen in the least amount of time, meaning three to six months. Which factories could we open in the least amount of time that cost the least amount of tax, US taxpayer dollars. And the third was which ones could we open up in the least amount of time costing the least amount of US taxpayer dollars that will re-employ the most amount of Iraq, Iraqis. So 60 factories are identified. And as we went about reopening these factories and putting Iraqis back to work, we quickly learned that they didn't want to be carrying around AK-47s. They wanted to go back to work because the average Iraqi worker supports eight dependents at home. The average American worker supports four. So imagine a mom or a dad, a dad in this case, that loses their job. How do these support your family? And so that's why they resorted to violence, because these insurgents were coming in saying, we'll pay you cash. Screw those Americans. We'll pay you cash and you can feed your family. And so we saw immediately the impact of putting people back to work. And when I left Iraq in 2010, unemployment had dropped down to 18%. 18%. There was a briefing with General Petraeus. I was embedded when General Petraeus was the commanding general. And he had two sheets of paper on his conference room table, and I'll never forget this. And he asked a potential investor, a US investor that was looking at investing money in Iraq. And he said, well, General, I'm just worried about the violence. And the General Petraeus slid two pieces of paper in front of him and said, tell me what you see in these two sheets of paper. He looked at one, and he said, well, looks like violence is on the rise. I don't think I'll invest in this place. The other, paper, mm, violence has declined. This looks, like a, this looks like a place where we can invest. And General Petraeus told him that sheet of paper where violence is on the rise, that's Washington, DC. The sheet of paper where violence is in decline, that's a rock. Now tell me why you don't want to invest in a rock. Well, what do you say when you've got a four-star general? And so needless to say, they started investing, but we were in, uh, attracting just foreign and direct investment opportunities, putting people back to work because we knew at the end of the day, our soldiers would be safer. And if you remember Fallujah, Fallujah, they killed US contractors, they burned them and they hung them upside down on the bridge for everyone to see. And when the Marines were there, it was just an ugly, ugly place to be. After putting people back to work, we were with Marines back in Fallujah and they said, holy cow, we could walk around, we could shop, we can buy gifts for our families in the local markets. We're watching Shia and Sunni come together and have meetings, though they were tense, but they were facilitating an important conversation. So it was um, very important work that we did. And um, I took a total of 14 trips uh, across two presidential administrations. And I tell everybody I do it all over again because I saw firsthand the bravery of the men and women that wear the uniform, the bravery of our bravery of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. It was a team effort, not just those that wore the uniform, but it was a team effort for those that were civilians. It was a team effort for those that were contractors as well. And civilians like me, we couldn't carry guns. The Defense Department doesn't allow civilians to carry weapons. So here you are in a combat zone without a gun. Um, and so we, I'm, I'm only here today for two reasons. I was protected by the greatest military in the history of the planet, and Iraqis and Iranians have bad aim. That's the only reason why I'm still here today. And I'm grateful that they have bad aim. Fast forward, Eric, how much time do I have? I want to make sure that uh, now that I've got a talk radio show, I can talk for three hours. And I've got about eight minutes. There, see, there we go. Eight minutes. Perfect. Boy, that's... That's not a lot, but uh, <laughs> the other thing about service, and I talk about, we talked about this at the very beginning is service. And I still, I'm still not done serving my country or my community. And I still don't know what that's gonna look like, but I had a chance to work with the White House and the Trump administration on criminal justice reform. And that became a topic that I never thought I'd be passionate about. But after doing research, it became something that I wanted to make a difference. I started to write national op-eds. I'm a columnist for Newsmax and for Washington Examiner. And my op-ed started to generate the attention of the White House and Jared Kushner. And I started to work with Jared in a very small capacity behind the scenes. I was working with Van Jones and his organization, Cut 50 and Kim Kardashian on criminal justice reform. 
and it turned out to be something for me to not only just try and serve our community, but serve our country and help reverse some of these policies that were detrimental to, and I'm part Mexican, to the black and brown communities. And together, together, Republicans, Democrats, independents, we reformed a broken and racist criminal justice system. And it's just the first step. We got many more steps to go, but it was historic. And it showed that Washington can come together. And this was a perfect example. Let me tell you a couple of quick things that I love about the First Step Act and why it's so important and why I, I urge, and I'm working a little bit with the Biden administration, why I'm urging the Biden administration to take up their version of the Second Act. America incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. Did you know that? More than Iran, more than Venezuela, more than China, more than Russia, more than North Korea. We also spend $40 billion a year, over $40 billion a year to keep inmates in prison. Compassionate release before the First Step Act, 96% of inmates and their families who were given a, a, a health diagnosis where they had very little time left. Stage four diagnosis, they had weeks or months left to live. The D Bureau of Prisons was denying 96% of compassionate release requests. Women, women in America, in American jails were chained and handcuffed to the hospital bed when they'd give birth in prison. The first step back said, we're gonna reverse this trend. Now I'm not speaking about violent inmates. I'm speaking about these nonviolent, oftentimes first time offenders or drug offenders. The fact that you've got people in prison, 20, 30 year sentences on a mar or mar marijuana charges. You've got examples of a gentleman who needed money for his family. And so he sold five prescription pills. He's now serving 24 years in prison because he was painted to be a international drug kingpin. First step said, we got to send these people home. We got to give them a, a second chance because they've never had a first chance at a second chance. We've got to give them a second chance. And so the pressure now is on the Bureau of Prisons to reverse compassionate release so that more people are going home. So they, instead of dying handcuffed and behind bars, they die in the arms of loved ones. That's very important. Women are no longer handcuffed and chained to a hospital bed when they give birth thanks to the First Step Act. And so it was God's work, and we've got lots of more, lots more work to do. I'm working with families today on this pro bono, working to, get, to see if we can secure their loved one's release. Because after, I'm sure you've read about a couple of high-profile and controversial commutations that I helped engineer, but it gave me a platform. Because now when I ask for something and we need to look at this case, people look at it. If I didn't have that platform before, no one would pay any attention, but now I've got that platform. Thanks to the Wall Street Journal that did a big front page story on me. I now have a platform. And so I'm using that platform to work with those families, not just here in Chicago, but across the country who want to see their loved, home, loved ones come home because prison should be reserved for those, not that we're mad at, but for those that we're afraid of. And oftentimes we have, a, our prisons are filled with people that we're mad at and we need to send them back home. But one other point before we transition in terms of service and something that I'm honored to be a part of is Judson University's World Leaders Forum, continuing this service, serving our community, serving our country, serving the world. And as Judson University's World Leaders Forum, and I'm honored to serve as the chairman of the board and that whole objective, that whole objective is to raise money to bring in world leaders to this small 1200 person Christian university that no one's ever heard of. And we bring in our first year, just like in 1905, when a couple of folks got together and created the Rotary Club. In 2010, a couple of people got together, including myself, and let's create the World Leaders Forum. And one of the alumni uh, worked very hard and, and, and quarterbacked that effort. But the whole objective is to raise money for student scholarships, entrepreneurship, diversity, and for foster children. The statistics of those that are in foster care that graduate from college are very small. So we had those three objectives about raising money for these students. And so we went out and asked all these world leaders if they'd come out to Judson. 
Our first year, we had former President George W. Bush to this small, no-name, 1,200-person Christian campus in Elgin. We had former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. We had former Mexican President Philippe Calderon. We had Condoleezza Rice. We had former Russian Soviet Union leader Mikhail Gorbachev. We had a substantive debate with Newt Gingrich and Howard Dean, two gentlemen that are on political opposites. And we've raised nearly a million dollars for student scholarships. And we've created a second and third series. We've created an inspiration series. We've had Mary Lou Retton, the Olympian. We've had um, Nick Voinovich, I think I'm butchering his last name, but he was born without arms or legs. I wasn't able to make that event, but you know, part of the question then the Judson's president said, how do you greet a guy that doesn't have arms or legs? Well, when you walk up to him, he says, can you give me a hug? That's how he greets. That's how he shakes hands. And everyone that got a hug from Nick said it was the best. It was the most loving, tender, powerful hug that they've ever received in their entire life. So we have the inspiration series. And third, we have conversations with Mark Vargas. So if you're not already bored now, you're really going to be bored. And my first guest was Mark Cuban. And Mark's a very close friend of mine. And I asked him if he'd launch my speaker series. And he did. And my speaker series raises money, not just for student scholarships and entrepreneurship and diversity, but it also raises money for Judson University's RISE program. And RISE is a program that's very unique. It's very unique because only 5% of colleges and universities in the United States offer a program for students with intellectual disabilities. And most of these students have Down syndrome. If you're a parent, and David knows all about this, and he's my mother is the director of the RISE program at Judson, and David's been very active on this, both behind the scenes and, and out front, is if you're a parent with a child with Down syndrome, you don't save money for that child to go to college. So every year, those children are waving to their, their brothers or sisters, waving goodbye and helping them pack to go to college, but there's nothing for them. So Judson is unique, really unique, that they offer a program, a two-year certification. They live on campus. They live in the dorms, and they become the most popular kids on campus. And it's incredible to see football players and basketball players and soccer players hugging and loving on these students. They've become the lifeline of the campus. And I get emotional talking about it because it's, it's wonderful to see. And I told Judson's president, you know, I told him, if Christ were here on earth, he wouldn't be hanging out with us in fancy suits or in the administration building. He wouldn't be hanging out with professors talking about theology. He wouldn't be with, in the fitness center working out with the athletes he'd be with the RISE students. And that's where we need to be too. And so my speaker series raises money for the RISE students. And so on July 9th, I've got Terrence Howard, Hollywood actor Terrence Howard coming out to help raise money for, our, for the scholarships and for RISE students. And so I'd encourage you to go to uh, judsonu.edu backslash WLF to learn about the World Leaders Forum or judsonu.edu backslash WLF conversations. Uh, July 9th, I'd love to see everybody there. Tickets are 75 for general admission, 500 for VIP, meet and greet. It's also going to include a dinner with Terrence and I, and you'll get to meet the students because they're there. You get to see your investment in real time, and it's going to be a really important event. And I know I've gone two minutes over, and so I apologize for that. But um, again, thank you for the work that you're doing, and it was an honor and a privilege uh, to be here today, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. If you want to hang out up here, we'll, sure. we'll take some questions. Oh, yeah. Well, Mark, you've given us a lot to, to think about. That was an incredible presentation um, and a lot of different uh, incredible things that you're engaged with. So uh, let's start with questions from our live audience First, um, and uh, we have a question back there. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. How do you explain compassionate release to the victims of violent crimes and their families? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And we sort of have to differentiate between those that are violent inmates 
uh, and those that are nonviolent inmates. And so this isn't a blanket compassionate release. And obviously everything has to be reviewed by the Bureau of Prisons, but it's not about the, the narrative that many in the media, and I deal with the media all the time, local and national, and um, the, the media, the narrative that they want to create is that we're releasing violent inmates back onto the streets. That's not true. Now, there it does happen, but, th but that's the discussion. It's not a perfect system, but the objective is not to release violent inmates. The objective is to release the grandfather who's been in prison for 35 years because he sold a little bit of marijuana and he can't get out, and now he's dying of stage four cancer. Those are the, those are the folks that we need to send home. In fact, and it's important to point this out, you know, the Bureau of Prisons, if uh, there's hundreds and thousands of examples, they don't even allow you to go home to say goodbye to your wife or husband that of 50 years that passed away. You're denied that. You're denied the chance to say goodbye. You're denied the chance to attend a funeral. You're denied a chance to attend a wake. And so, again, we're, we're folks, that, violent inmates, very separate conversation, Nonviolent inmates, we've got to show some compassion. And I thank the local business community, not only in Chicago, but across the country, that have opening up their doors to hire those. And we want to remove that scarlet letter. And so there's a lot of companies that have come together, Coca-Cola and so many others that have said, we're going to give, we're going to be part of this program uh, to give folks a second chance. Any other questions from our live audience here today? Todd, you got a mic, mic right behind you there. You had mentioned uh, Chicago, Detroit, and Philadelphia uh, as high violent cities. Uh, New York and Boston, their violence has uh, tremendously decreased because of uh, community involvement. Chicago is the most segregated city in the United States. What is a step to breaking the segregation boundaries in this city? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I wish I was governor or mayor, but because <laughs> uh, I, I do a lot of things. But, you know, I, I do a lot of work with Bernie Carrick and, and with Mayor Giuliani in, in New York. And again, I, I have to preface this because the media will paint me some something and say that I said something that I didn't or cut things out. But in New York, twenty two hundred deaths per year in New York when Giuliani became mayor, when he left eight hundred. It can be done. You got to work together. And I come from a Washington, 12 years in Washington, where we did used to work together. And I think that we've got to put aside this, the partisan bickering, because it's, it's impacting lives. And so I, I'll try and use my platform as much as I can to encourage our leaders, to encourage our leaders to work together, because working together saves lives. And this is a perfect example of it. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to glance over here at our chat. Um, I'm not really seeing any questions here from our Zoom audience. You guys are a, a quiet group today. Uh, any other questions here in the room for, for Mark? Uh, Alita has a question. Uh, Karen's coming over with the mic. So with your criminal justice reform, what steps are you taking to not get black and brown people in jail you know they are we are easily twice as t pulled over twice as much we're easily you know incarcerated incarcerated for longer periods of times for the same crimes as white or non-black and brown people isn't the first step to keep them from going to jail to the to begin with versus how to get them compassionate release once they got there? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. And, um, you know, you're really hitting to the heart of the issue. And compassion comes in so many different shapes and forms. And I think that um, there's no doubt that black and brown communities are treated very differently. And we see that in prison, when you look at the same, the same crime, the difference in sentences is dramatic, dramatic decades differences. And, and we've got to fix that. But I think that using, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but using my time, Rock, giving people educational opportunities, getting people 
trade schools. You don't have to go to college. You don't have to have a college degree. I mean, if you looked at my college transcripts, you would think that I'd, uh, you know, I was a, C, a happy C student. Um, but I think we need to provide opportunities and show that you're, you're valued, right? And, um, and providing this type of support and care to the community, that there's life besides crime that you don't have to, a lot of them are working because that's the only way they make money. You don't have to go live a life of crime to make money and support your loved ones. There's other opportunities and we don't necessarily have to say it's college because it's not college. It could be a trade school, it could be other things. One of the most interesting things, one of my favorite books is called Lincoln's Melancholy. And we all know that Abraham Lincoln suffered from depression throughout many periods of his life. And he would write often at times that he was suicidal. And he was asked by one of his friends why he never committed suicide. And this was before he was a congressman and before he was a president. And it's fascinating. And the question was, and tell them I said hello. The question was that, uh, if, ask them if they have a question as well. I'm happy to answer the question. <laughs> and they asked Abraham Lincoln, and this was documented, why have you never committed suicide? And his answer was so profound. His answer was, because I haven't done anything in this life to be remembered by. If I die, no one's going to know who Abraham Lincoln was. And if you look at when he was a little boy, his mother used to have dreams that one day a thousand angels will dance on your son Abraham's grave. She had no idea what that meant. And she would ask Abe, and he had no idea what that meant. And then you look at the, at the end when he's in the Peterson house as he takes his last breath. And the Secretary of War said, now he belongs to the ages. That was hip 9-11 moment. He knew he had a purpose. And purpose means everything. A friend of mine who works with Pope Francis, very close with Pope Francis, um, the chairman of the Council of Cardinals is a dear friend, friend of mine, his eminence, Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maridaga from Honduras. A friend of ours said, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked um, uh, Cardinal Maridaga, and I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Pope Francis. Are you comfortable with your destiny? And so I think we need to make sure that people know that they're valued. And I think that we need to make sure they have opportunities. And I, they need to know that there's a purpose for their life, that you don't have to stand in front. You don't have to be the president of Rotary One. You don't have to be me. Every job's important. I'm a son of a truck driver. Guess what? We don't get our food if my dad and his colleagues out on the road every week are delivering these shipments of food. Every person counts like an airplane, right? An airplane won't take off that they've got technical issues. They've got to get it all fixed. Everything works in harmony. And I think as a country, again, a pluribus unum, we work better when we're in harmony. Thank you very much, Mark. I think we're going to wrap up the questions now, but let's give Mark another round of applause. <laughs> Hold on one second, because we do have a, a very small token of our appreciation to share with you. Uh, and we give these out. Usually we're mailing them. So this is a distinct pleasure to be able to hand it to you in person. I don't even know how this, how this works here. Um, but we, we offer all of our speakers uh, a gift of thanks. And of course, we want to support our local community. So these candles here, the proceeds from these candles support Bright Endeavors. And their mission is to empower young moms by providing transitional jobs, and professional skills training. So this obviously helps those moms, it supports their kids, it supports the community. So I'd like to hand this over to you. Thank you very and much. Thank you again for coming. Thank you very much. The fastest thing I've gotten from the Chicago post office here. In yeah, <laughs> exactly. Thank you, thank you so much, Mark. Oh, uh, pardon me one moment. I need to turn the laptop back around so our Zoom audience can see our in-person audience. All right, my apologies to the folks on Zoom. I had to just flip the laptop around so could, I could actually read the chat box and see if there were any questions from our Zoom audience. So uh, I want to uh, thank our, our Rotarians for the, the great work that you've all done during the year, despite the pandemic, uh, doing things, continuing our programs, like as, as Mark was talking about, our, our job program, our job skills training program, job one, many other efforts. Um, and I think uh, a direct result of that is the number of new members that we continue to see come into the club uh, despite the pandemic. So we do actually have a new member induction today. So uh, Freddie, if you could come up to the stage, please. 
Um, I have a long spiel here to read off. So <laughs> you can just stand here to my left and bear with me a moment while I do this. Laura Inns, our membership chair, is uh, out of town today. So she was not able to do this. So this is actually the first time that I've done this myself. So I'm, I may mess it up, but uh, you'll still be a member of Rotary One. So don't worry. Uh, thank you. It is my great pleasure on behalf of the board of directors and members of the Rotary Club of Chicago to welcome you as a member of Rotary One. We welcome you not only for the fine fellowship that we shall share, but also for your talents, abilities, and enthusiasm that will help us to carry out many projects to make our community, our country, and the world a better place in which to live. Rotary is not a political organization, but all Rotarians are vitally concerned with everything pertaining to good citizenship and the election of good men and women to public office. Rotary is not a charitable organization, yet its activities exemplify the charity and the sacrifices that one should expect from people who believe that they have a responsibility to help others. Rotary is not a religious organization, but it is built on those eternal principles that have served as the moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business and professional people pledged to upholding the highest professional standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and international peace can be achieved when business people unite under the banner of service. Freddie, you've been chosen for membership in the Rotary Club of Chicago because your fellow Rotarians believe you to be a leader in your profession and because you manifest the intelligence and commitment of heart that fit you to interpret and impart the message of Rotary. You are a representative of your profession in this club and any information of an educational value pertaining to that profession must naturally come to us through you. At the same time, you become an ambassador from us to your profession and we rely on you to carry the principles and ideals of service, which we here inspire to those who share your professional activity. The community will know and judge Rotary by your embodiment of it in character and service. And we accept you as a member because we know our principles and organization will be safe in your keeping. We also expect you to give us the inspiration that will help us to become better Rotarians. And it is with this hope that I, as president of the Rotary Club of Chicago, invest you with the distinguishing pin of a Rotarian and gladly offer you the right hand of Rotary Fellowship. Uh, is there a good place I can pin this on you? Uh, you want to pin it on the yeah. Or... Um, yeah, I don't want, you've got a really nice shirt. So I can also just hand you the pin. <laughs> <laughs> and extend my hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Freddie. <laughs> well, don't go too far. Um, I'm going to ask you to do your, your first assignment as a Rotarian, which is to tell us a minute or two uh, about yourself, sure. what, draw you, what drew you to, to Rotary, and uh, what you do as a profession. Uh, thank you. Sure. Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for having me today and great presentation today. Um, one thing that brought me to Rotary is I have a mentor. I'm from Greenville, Alabama, small town, and uh, you probably heard about the storms going on down in Alabama recently. I played football at Georgia Tech. Uh, I came to Chicago 15 years ago. I came here from uh, Newport Beach, California. I was driving back to Alabama and I stopped to visit a buddy here in Chicago in the summertime and I never made it home. <laughs> uh, so that's how I got to Chicago. Um, but I would like to say, uh, you know, I opened my State Farm Agency uh, September 2018. And uh, me being a small town kid, uh, the community was what raised me. You know, I say it take a village to raise a kid. And that's who raised me. My mom was a single mom. And all I did was play sports year round, football and basketball. And uh, my mentor, uh, I reached out to him in Alabama. I told him, hey, I'm ready to start giving back to Chicago. I want to do my civic park. And he said, you need to join Rotary. And uh, he's the president of Rotary down in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, that's how I ended up with a great group of guys you are right now. Uh, looking forward to doing my part. Um, already making some great connections. And I do want to thank you all for having me. So thank you. That's a great story. 
I just came back from Alaska for a few weeks. I almost didn't come back either. So I can understand the feeling. Um, and did I correctly in your bio that you're also uh, an alumnus of uh, Kappa Alpha Psi? Is that right? Yeah, we, we actually have another member who's very active in the local alumni chapter of Kappa, Kappa Alpha Psi, Wayman Anderson. So yeah, I'll, I'll connect the two of you. I think he's actually on the Zoom portion of the meeting right now, which I can't, which I can't see. So <laughs> I'm sure he is like widely waving right now saying, I'm here, I'm here. Um, I also wanted to, uh, since we have had several member inductions uh, over the, the course of Zoom, we do have one of our new members here today, Shada Calderwood. Uh, Shada, would you like to come up? And I can at least give you a pin in person. <laughs> Why don't we give a round of applause for Shada as well? And I'm not, I'm also not going to attempt to pin this on you, but I'm just going to hand it to you in person. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank shake you. your hand. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much, Shada, for all that you've already done for the organization. Um, I feel like even though we've uh, we've been virtual, I've seen you a lot yeah. <laughs> now at all the, the service opportunities thank and you. projects you've come out to. So thank you so thank much. You. My honor. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to see how we're doing on time here. Oh, wow, it is 119. So we do have a series of announcements here today. Uh, I am going to skip over introductions of guests at the moment. If you are, I know I see a few guests out here today. Um, if you want to hang around after the end of the meeting, I'd be happy to come by and shake your hand. If you're Rotarian, certainly we can exchange a, a banner as well. And my apologies to the folks on Zoom, but I do want to make sure uh, to get through all of our announcements. Um, so I'm going to skip right over to our volunteer opportunities. Uh, since we have uh, uh, a brand new member in the room is looking to get engaged. I'm going to give you several opportunities right off the bat here. Um, and the first one uh, is organized by our uh, president uh, designee, um, Alita Williams. Uh, she's been doing delivering. What's that? Oh, yeah, they probably all are related to you, Alita, which is no surprise, actually. Uh, so we, um, Mark mentioned about the, the meals that we had been delivering. Those were, of course, all the, the work of Alita. And you may remember that we were delivering those meals to seniors at, at uh, Maple Point Apartments. Uh, we pressed pause on that for a moment, but it's coming back in a slightly reconstituted form. Uh, and uh, now that uh, the seniors are no longer confined to their apartments, as some of the restrictions have been lifted and they've been vaccinated, uh, what we're doing now is we're going to be doing a monthly meal. And so you can go there and actually help prepare the meal and actually enjoy the meal together uh, with the seniors. And so we need folks to help volunteer to prepare and, and, and distribute that meal and frankly, just socialize. Uh, with the seniors. And so that'll be Friday, July 9th, 150 West Maple Street, uh, starting from 5.30 p.m. and going until 7.30. And there's a few different things that you can be engaged with there. On Saturday, July 10th, that's the day right after that, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., we need folks to help fill hand sanitizer bottles. This will be for the Jesse White Trunk Party. You're going to be hearing a lot about the Jesse White Trunk Party if you're new to this club. If you're not new to the club, you know what this is all about. Uh, we help pack these giant trunks of materials to send Chicago kids off to college with so they can they can uh, start their semester uh, with the same stuff that uh, the other students will have as well. And so uh, on Saturday, July 10th, you can help with the hand sanitizer. On Friday, July 16th, uh, we need volunteers to just transport uh, bags and boxes and other things around the uh, Jesse White Community Center for the trunk party. And then finally, on Saturday, July 17th, uh, we need folks to actually distribute the trunks uh, to Chicago uh, students. So uh, check the gyrator, the newsletter, uh, talk to, to any of us, myself, to Alita, and we can get you connected there. Um, there's also a service trip to Guatemala being organized by a club here in the district. That's in November. Uh, again, feel free to reach out to any of us for more information. It is also in the Gyrator newsletter. 
Uh, we have a couple of interesting events coming up. I'm going to start with uh, events that are not necessarily specific to our club, um, but our, our very own past president, Connor G., and uh, future uh, district governor is hosting an event, a uh, virtual event, free virtual event uh, with folks in Australia uh, this afternoon at 4.30 p.m. Central Time. And it's all about why do young members join Rotary and how can we increase youth membership? We also have the Safe Haven Run and Run Walk. Uh, it's global. It's virtual. Uh, it's July 17th through July 25th. Uh, we have our own Rotary One team. We are sponsoring them as we do every year. And uh, they just do great work for the homeless community. Uh, really, it's a soup to nuts organization that gets people off the streets and back to being productive members of society. So anything we can do to help uh, Nelly and a safe haven is much appreciated. So again, the information's in the newsletter. If you want to sign up, it's a virtual walk and run, which means you can do it on your own time. It is super easy and nobody's really there to check that you're actually doing it. So, you know, you can do your best. Maybe you can just bike too, <laughs> safely, but you can, you, can, you can bike as well. As, as always, uh, we have a lot of committee meetings coming up and our board meeting as well. Uh, it's a great way to see how the work of the club gets done. Uh, Freddie, I encourage you, for example, to, to stop by uh, one of the meetings. Uh, they're all virtual at this, at this moment, so it's kind of easy to drop by and just sort of see how you know, how everything gets done, uh, the, the sausage making, as they say. Uh, our board meeting, our next board meeting is July 6th. Uh, we have community service coming up here, marketing, international service, all throughout July. It's all on the calendar, uh, so you can find it. You can find it there on the website. Uh, we do have our Friday roundtables at the Union League Club. Those continue to be uh, going strong. We get a good amount of people coming out every week. It's one floor down from here every Friday noonish or so show up. There'll be a table there. You'll meet some fellow Rotarians and have a little bit more time to, to chat than you do in the structure of a meeting such as today. June 29th. Next week, uh, you guys are finally rid of me. Well, not totally rid of me, but at least rid of me from uh, being up here uh, in front of you guys. Uh, you have the installation of our next president, Marga Huco. Uh, reception with Cash Bar starts at 11.30 a.m. Uh, apparently, it's not too early to drink. Uh, you also have our Rotary International president-elect, Shikar Mehta, uh, is going to be administering the oath of office to Marga. Uh, is Shikar actually here in person, Marga? He, he will be in India, so it'll be a virtual. Um, uh, virtual, and Shikar will be up very late from India. So that is very kind of him. He's probably used to that by now, is my, is my guess. Uh, and we also have um, our incoming Rotary District Governor, Jane Hopkins, will be here. And that's a good transition to the other event going on later that day, which is the installation of Jane Hopkins, uh, which will be going on down at the Jacob Henry Mansion in a state down in Joliet. I know at least some of us after this event will be walking two blocks to LaSalle Street Station and taking the train down to Joliet uh, to attend her uh, installation that evening. We have July 6th, our next Rotary one meeting is Rotary After Work with Desmond Clark, former Chicago Bear, uh, also a keynote speaker and author. And then July 13th, we have legendary chef and author Ina Pinckney. And so uh, with that, um, we do, we have the, uh, the four-way test. And if we put that up, very good. And so I almost don't even know how to do this anymore, but since we all are, or at least some of us are here in the room together, maybe we can all just stand and actually read the four-way test together. Is that, is that possible? Okay, well, let's start out, shall we? First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concern? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendship? Fourth, will be beneficial to all concerned. Meeting adjourned.